That's everybody made it out this morning on this uh, rainy Sunday morning. Open your Bibles once again if you've had them with you. Uh, to the book of 1 Corinthians. We've made it now to chapter 4. And we're going to look at just the first uh, seven verses this morning as we will learn what it means to be a servant of Christ. A servant. I think we all know what it means to, uh, to be a servant. Uh, that, that sometimes... Um, <laughs> That's what we feel like in the workplace, right? We feel like we're a servant. And then in the home, uh, we have a role there where we uh, serve in the home. And, and definitely, if we're operating uh, properly as followers of Jesus, we'll be servants here right. as well that will serve within the, the, the body of Christ. Uh, Paul is continuing to, uh, to, to build on the, the understanding of, of the, the church, of who the people of God are. Uh, last week, we... Uh, we were reminded that, that every Christian is to be a fool for Christ. Right? That how, we, how we think, how we behave, how we live our lives, it, it's going to seem like it's foolishness to those that don't follow Jesus. Right? A lot of the things that we do, uh, the way that we spend our time, the way that we'll uh, spend our money, uh, uh, the, the way we order our lives, the, the, uh, 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 the way we... Uh, use our calendar, right, our time, all those things will seem like it's nonsense and foolishness to those that don't know Jesus. But for us, we understand that we are being fools for Christ. And so this morning, we're going to think about the, the topic of being a servant of Christ and, and what that means. And, and for me, anyway, whenever I, uh, I hear the word servant and I associate it with the church, my first thought goes to deacons. Right, and, and and some of you might be the same way that that's that's the role of deacons, that's the role of Levon, that's the role of Rod and any other men uh, that in the future days would be called to serve in that uh, capacity. Uh, you know, the 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 but the, the passage makes it clear, I believe, that it's not just the role of the deacons to serve the church. It's right. we all have a responsibility to serve the church, right? right? That, that's what we'll, we'll see as we begin to, to work through our, our passage this morning. In fact, the word that's translated as servant in the passage is uh, uh, hupe retes uh, and not diakonos, right? There's just some Greek words and you, you can say, see that I don't know how to pronounce it either. It's just my studies, that's what I saw. And that's two different words that, that's used there. The word diakonos is usually associated with deacon and that's not the one that's used here. It's a different word, right? And so every believer is a servant, but not every believer is a deacon. That's right? right. That sets two, two separate issues. The office of deacon is reserved for those men who are called by God to serve as deacons within the body of Christ. They're set aside and ordained to serve as deacons to the local church. And so while we're kind of talking about deacons early on, I think it's helpful for us to, to, to kind of remind us of, of, of the, the qualifications and the characteristics that, that we have for our deacons, for the ones that we have now, and for those that may be in the, uh, in the months, years, or whatever the case might be that would come forward or we would recognize in. In 1 Timothy 3, uh, 8 through 13, we see this. It says, likewise, following after the characteristics and qualification for a pastor, it says, likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the ministry of the faith with a pure conscience, but let these also first be tested that then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. <laughs> Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who served well as deacons obtained for themselves a good standing and a great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so... Uh, these are the, the characteristics, right, and the qualifications. And so it's an ongoing thing. It's not just a one. They, you know, they did this once and they're qualified. It's a, it's a pattern of life is what uh, we see here is what Paul was talking about writing to uh, Timothy. So what does a, what does a deacon do? Right? I would say that from what we see in scriptures, a, a deacon primarily serves the church by meeting the, the, the practical needs of the church, the, the physical needs of the church, the the deacons help the pastor by taking care of the physical needs within the body of Christ so that the pastor can give his attention to 
uh, the, the, the ministry of prayer and the study of God's word, right? That's the, that's the, 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 the role that the, the deacons play within the church. That's what we see in the book of Acts, right? Acts chapter 7 is where uh, we see the, the forerunner, I guess you could say, to the office of, of deacon. We, we see that there were uh, some, some widows that were being overlooked and, and not uh, getting their food the way they should. And uh, the apostles come to a, a, a decision that this is not good. That we can't do all this, right? And again, the apostles, again, just you want to say serve in a, in a role of, of a similar to a pastor today, and, and they were they could do uh, the ministry, they could pray, and they could study God's word, and they could meet some of the needs whenever it was a small group. But but now in the book of Acts chapter seven, guess what? It's not a small group anymore. It's thousands, thousands of people, and they couldn't nearly meet those needs. And, and God led them to say, we need to do something about this. We need to set some, some godly men, some, some men that have servants' hearts, set them aside to serve in this capacity to meet the needs. And we see this uh, uh, in Acts chapter 6. I'm sorry, not 7. Acts 6, verses 1 through 7. It says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected, the ne neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitudes of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, uh, Nicanor, Timon, uh, Parmenius, uh, and Nicholas, uh, a proselyte from uh, Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And so what can we take from this? Just, just these uh, verses in, in Acts chapter 6. I believe we can see that when pastors do their jobs and when deacons do their job, what they're called to do, the Word of God spreads and disciples are multiplied greatly. And when pastors don't do their jobs and deacons don't do their jobs, guess what? It doesn't happen, right? The Word doesn't spread and disciples are multiplied greatly. And so we all have our role and our function uh, to do within the church. We all have our responsibilities within the church. Though we have some godly men, we have two got very godly men that serve our church and serve our church well. It's not just their job to serve the church. We all have a duty and an obligation to serve within the church as well also, right? And so that's what we'll see as we look a little bit a little bit more at our text this morning as we pull some more of these truths from our scriptures this morning. And so let's do that. What does a, being a servant of Christ look like? Let's grab our Bibles now and stand as we do as our custom is here, as we honor the reading of God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Beginning in verse 1, says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. And in fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us to... to, to us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? This is God's Word. Father, we thank you again for this day that you have given us. God, we thank you for your Word before us this morning. God, we ask that you would teach us that, that you're, you would serve us by teaching us your word this morning, Father. I ask that you would help us to examine our own lives, our own hearts, 
and, 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 and be honest with ourselves, be honest before you, God. Are we being the servants of Christ that, that you have called us to be? And if we're not, God, help us to become the servants that you've called us to be. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, some of you might be reading this this morning for the first time, and some of you may have studied it this last week some, and you're thinking to yourself, Brother Mike, you're kind of taking this, these verses out of context. And... Uh, to be fair to the context, Paul was primarily referring to himself, wasn't he? And Apollos, he says us, right? He's talking about themselves being servants. But I think everything that we have before us in these verses, we can apply it to ourselves. Again, as I said earlier, being a servant to the church isn't just a deacon, deacon's job. Right. And all these principles that we see that, that, are, uh, that Paul is saying, this, this, is, this should be found within me as an apostle, or this should be found within Apollos as, as a pastor and teacher. All of these truths apply to every one of us. Every one of us uh, should strive to be the, the same type of servant of Christ as Paul was being, or Apollos was being, or Peter was being, or anyone else has, has ever been. And so that's what we'll see here uh, in these verses this morning. That, that We'll see three characteristics of a servant of Christ. And the first one that we see is that he or she be faithful. Right? Be, be faithful. A servant of Christ must be faithful in their service to God. We see that first in the first two verses. It says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. And so what we have here is Paul was again inviting the Corinthian believers to consider the way that, that he and Apollos had conducted themselves. He's saying, remember, Remember when I was among you. Remember when Paul, Apollos was among you. Remember how we conducted ourselves. That they can, uh, they, uh, they never conduct themselves as if they were superior to everyone else, right? They didn't, they didn't set themselves apart and saying we're better than you or we're more powerful than you or or we deserve more reverence and respect than you than you do. They never demanded to be treated like they were celebrities or like they were royalty, right? The the believers in Corinth they did that. They're the ones who, who, who set them apart that way. They the one, they're the ones who took it upon themselves to treat them in the same way they would treat the great philosophers of that day. Right? That's, that's what they were doing. They, began, they, they treated them uh, as, as though they were still operating according to the wisdom of the world. That was one of the issues that Paul was addressing. You see, Apollos and Paul hadn't come to Corinth to be served. They had come to Corinth to serve. They've come there to serve the church because that's what servants of Christ do. Servants of Christ should strive to do the same things that Christ did when He came down from heaven and robed Himself in flesh and dwelt among us, right? What did Christ come down to do besides save us? To serve. To serve. Not to be served, but to serve. The, the Greek word translated as servant here literally means under oarsman, right? Or, or, or an under rower. Uh, the under oarsman was a slave that rode on the lowest deck of a, of a, of a ship. A slave, right? A, a slave that was, was chained, most often chained to the, a bench and chained to the oars. And back in those days, they didn't have you know, the, uh, engines like we have today. They didn't have a, a, a 150 horsepower engine. They had a, a, a 150 man powered engine, right? They would work them oars. And they would whip them, right? If they slowed down, they would whip them some more. If they wasn't going fast enough, they'd whip them some more. And, and if you've seen the movies where usually somebody's sitting there with a drum and keeping and cadence so they can all row at the, the same time. And so that's kind of what Paul's talking about here. And the one thing into their mindset, what a servant is. A, a servant has no rights. A, a servant has no privileges. They, they, they simply rowed when they were told to row. Their comfort or personal preferences was never a factor to the captain. <laughs> the, the captain wasn't concerned about what they preferred to do. The captain wasn't concerned about what would make them more comfortable. The, the, the captain just wanted them to do their job. Row. That's your job. That's what your responsibility is to row when you're told to row. Only a faithful under rower had value to the captain. The ones who were disobedient, the ones who didn't do what they were told to do, they didn't live very long. They, they didn't last very long at all. They, they would be removed rather quickly. I really like this question and answer that John Corson gave as being an under oarsman relates to being a servant of Christ. 
He said this. He said, what does it mean to be a servant? It doesn't mean to set the course or determine direction, but rather to simply do what the captain of the ship, Jesus Christ, tells us to do, knowing that he will bring us to the right destination. I think that's great. I think that's a great uh, uh, contrast or illustration uh, that he, he drew out there. I think it's also worth pointing out that being faithful is a requirement. That's right. <laughs> It's a requirement, right? It's not optional. And I think sometimes we, we, we act like it is. We may say we understand that it's required, but then we don't live like it's required, right? We will, we'll say, well, we'll be faithful whenever we feel like being faithful. We'll be faithful whenever it's convenient for us to be faithful, right? Mm. Yes? yes? Or is that just me? <laughs> it might be just me. Maybe I'm the only one who struggles with being faithful all the time or living my life as though it's required of me. It's required of all of us. We see it here in the text. Not, not just Paul, not just Apollos. All of us are required to be faithful. Faithful in our, in our service to God. We see this. As servants of Christ, Paul and Apollos were required to be faithful in their service to God. And likewise, we are required to be faithful in our service to God. In whatever way God has gifted us with spiritual gifts, He requires that we be faithful in how we use those gifts. To edify and to strengthen and to grow his church. Romans 12, verses 3 through 8. It says, For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or, or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, who, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So let me just stop and ask you, are you being faithful? Right? Are you being faithful in your service to God through being faithful in your service to His church? You see, faithfulness is required. Right? It's not optional. And it's not a recommendation. Servants of Christ are to be faithful in their stewardship of God's Word. Right? We see this also in these first two verses. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Not only did Paul and Apollos consider themselves to be servants of Christ, they also considered themselves to be stewards of the mysteries of God. Right? Stewards of God's Word. A steward is someone that manages something for someone else. Sure. A manager. right? Think, think of it that way. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to someone else. Think about the Old Testament and the, the story of of Joseph and Potiphar's house. That's what Joseph was. Joseph didn't own anything, but yet he managed everything in Potiphar's household, right? He had responsibility and, and care, and he, and he can use it uh, under Potiphar's authority. And so that's, I think, what Paul was talking about here is the same thing, to be a steward. It's not, it's not our word, it's God's word. Uh, and, and right when, when we come to, to gather as a church and we go to Sunday school, and we sit there and we study God's Word together, that's what we aim to do, right? We, you don't, we appreciate our teachers, and I hope you appreciate your pastor, but you don't come to hear from me, you come to hear from God. Amen. Right? Amen. And, and I'm just a steward. I'm a steward of the mystery, the mysteries of God and, and God's Word, and, and that's what we see here. And Paul and Apostle were required to be faithful stewards of the content of God's Word, to, to speak the truth of God's Word. They had no freedom to to edit what they saw or alter it, right? <laughs> the Bible's clear about that. We're not to take away anything or add to anything to, uh, to God's Word, right? Uh, if, if we do, we're to be accursed, right? And so they understood that. I think that's what Paul keeps on talking about being faithful, right? Faithful stewards of, of God's Word. They were only stewards that had been entrusted by God to reclaim what He had said in His Word. And that same truth applies to every pastor, Every teacher, every evangelist, every member of this church, every believer, 
We don't have any authority. We have no right to edit, to take away or to change. Because that's what will happen sometimes. Is we'll, we'll skip over parts or we'll leave parts out or, or we'll modify it a little bit to make it a little more palatable. We're, we're to taste a little better. We'll, we'll, we'll take out the parts that maybe sting a little bit or we'll avoid, uh, avoid some difficult passages because we know they're difficult and they may offend someone, right? We don't get to do that. Right. As faithful stewards, we don't, we don't have that ability or we don't have that uh, authority to, to, to do those type of things. The same truth applies to every believer because every believer is required to be a faithful steward of God's Word. When Jesus welcomes His people into heaven at the time of judgment, He isn't going to call us good servants. He's going to call us good and faithful servants, right? Good and faithful servants. Danny Aiken said this regarding the faithful stewardship of God's Word by pastors. He said, ministers have a special calling to proclaim the gospel and protect the gospel. When the gospel is misrepresented or compromised, added to or subtracted from, the minister of God must sound an immediate warning. To be faithful in ministry is to follow in the footsteps of Jesus as a servant of God and a servant to others. It is to have a passion for the faithfulness and obedience to our Heavenly Father that envelops everything that we do. Everything. Everything that we do. To be faithful stewards of God's Word, we must know what God's Word says and treat it like the precious treasure that it is like we see in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, 125 through 128 says this. He says, I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your, your law as void. Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold. Yes, than fine gold. Therefore, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. And I hate every false way. You see, church, it's not just my responsibility as a pastor to be a faithful steward of the mysteries of God's word. You have a responsibility, too. That's right. You have a responsibility, too, that we all share in this responsibility together. And so I just ask you again this morning, are you being a faithful steward of the mysteries of God? Are you? As servants of Christ, we are to be faithful in our service to God and in our stewardship of God's Word. The, the second characteristic that we see in our text of a servant of Christ is that he or she be gracious. Be gracious. I think we can see the personification of grace in Jesus Christ. All throughout the Gospels, we see manifestations of His grace towards others. Though He was cherished and adored by His followers, He was despised and often reviled and judged by others to be a blasphemer, especially by the religious leaders. We saw that in the Sunday school hour this morning. We kind of talked about that some, that some loved Him and adored Him and they cherished Him and they saw Him and believed Him to be the Messiah. But there were many others who did not uh, adore Jesus. They despised Him. Though He at times debated with them in order to bring to life the error of their ways to point out their hypocrisy, Jesus never attempted to defend Himself from their personal attacks. Did you notice that? That's right. He, he never uh, even tried to defend Himself. That's one of the things that they kind of stood out to others. It's like, how come He never defends Himself? Right? Why, why doesn't He do something about this? If He is the Messiah, why does He just keep on taking it? Right? I think one of the clear examples of this we see is when He is brought before Pilate in, in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 27, 11 and 14 it says this, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked Him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while He was being accused by the chief priests and elders, He answered, Nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. And so how was it that Jesus could just stand there and take it? Right? How could he do that? Just stand there and take it? I would say mainly because he was fulfilling the scriptures. That's right. Right? 
He was fulfilling God's word. You think about Isaiah 53, it's kind of all laid out there. That he remained silent as a sheep before the shearers. He answered not. Right? He didn't respond to their attacks and accusations that they made against him. But also, I believe he was demonstrating the kind of grace that his followers can have when they understand that God's judgment is the only judgment that really matters. Right? right? When we finally get it through our thick heads that the only judgment that really matters about us is what God judges about us, what God thinks about us. We're so consumed and we're so worried about what other people think, aren't we? Especially the culture we live in nowadays. We're, we're so obsessed about ourselves and, and what people think of us and we're always posting ourselves and we're doing selfies and TikToks and all these things wanting people to see how great we are. But what's funny about that is, is for, for most of us, when we, we the things we post online, the, the pictures we post, what are they? They're the best we have to offer. Mm. Right? Everything's been touched up and got the right filter on. Uh, we'll take 100 pictures, but only pull out the best ones because that's all we want people to see is the, the best. We, we never we, we post pictures of our, our kids and grandkids when they're swi or smiling and being sweet. Never do it when they're throwing a fit <laughs> or crying or, or whatever, right? And, and so we're so concerned about what other people think of us. What, what do people... They think about who we are and what kind of life we live and what, what are we presenting to the world. You see, once we understand that the only one that matters, the only opinion that matters really is God's opinion of us. Amen. Right? He is our judge. He is the one that we should aim to please, not everyone else. Paul came to understand this and helped him greatly to fulfill his calling as an apostle to the Gentiles. His fellow Jews, they weren't real pleased with him, were they? Right? He was a sellout. He was a traitor. First, he betrayed the faith. He, he turned his back on Judaism, to, to turned his back on his own people, and now he's going to the enemies. He's going to the Gentiles. And so he, he was used to being judged and coming under judgment from his fellow countrymen. It helped to prevent him from growing prideful and growing or, or growing dejected based on how he was judged by the people he taught and ministered to. Like Jesus, some people loved Paul and others hated him. And that was definitely the case in Corinth. That's part of what we're dealing with in this letter. As a servant of Christ, some people will love you and others will hate you. Yeah. You know that. <laughs> you should know that. And some people will love you and some people will hate you. Some people will, will, will think you're a fool and some people will have great respect for you. Right? People in the workplace, they know you're a Christian and they know that you pray. What will they do? Even, even if they don't they don't claim to follow Jesus or know anything about Jesus. They don't care about religion. But when something bad happens, who do they come to? That's right. They come to you. Hey, would you would you pray? Would you pray for my family? Would you pray for this situation, right? Or, or if a need comes up, hey, could you could you maybe get with your church people and see if they, they, you know somebody's house burnt down and right? They they come to you. They they know this about you. Some will love you and some will hate you. But we're to be gracious to both and be gracious to ourselves. Servants of Christ are to be gracious when they are judged by others. So look at verse 3, the beginning there. It says, But with me is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court. You know, if you first read that, and if this is all you had, you would say, Boy, Paul was arrogant. Right? He was, he was arrogant, but you see, he was just keeping the proper perspective on things. It's not that he wasn't concerned about the opinions of others towards him. It's just that he wasn't willing to let the opinions of others crush him or puff him up. Right? Because that can happen too, can't it? Mm -hmm. You know this. We all know this. That sometimes the words of others have a way of building us up or puffing us up or, or making us feel good. Or sometimes if they aren't pleasant words or we're criticized or whatever, it has a way to just kind of crush us, doesn't it? Right? And so that's kind of what Paul's talking about here. It's just that he wasn't willing to let opinions affect him that way. A word of caution, I believe, is warranted here because we must also be discerning of both criticism and praise that we receive. Right? Be discerning. Because you know, sometimes people have ulterior motives. Don't you realize that, right? I hope I'm not telling you anything new. Sometimes people will give you praise and give you compliments because they're they're manipulating you. They're trying to draw you in. They're trying to pull you over to their side because they want something from you or they want you to do something for them. That might be the motivation. 
And sometimes, likewise, criticism. Though we don't like being criticized, sometimes it's warranted. Amen? Amen. That, 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 that maybe we do need to make changes. Maybe we do need to watch how we talk to people. Maybe we do need to evaluate some things in our lives that we don't see. Maybe we have blind spots. And somebody comes to you and confronts you, and maybe it comes across as criticism, but it's, just, it's godly correction. Right? God's using that individual to, to, to kind of turn you around or to help you to, to make some course adjustments. Right? It's that, that, so we need to be discerning when, when people come to us with these judgments. Sometimes the same person that's quick to pat you on the back is the same person that's quick to stab you in the back. Mm. <laughs> right? Right? The same person that's quick to pat you in the back and say, hey, that's a great job. That's the same person that'll stick a knife in your back. Be discerning. Be discerning. Sometimes when we're being criticized, it's because it's warranted and we need to make some changes in our lives. Sometimes we actually have people in our lives that are willing to do what Ephesians 4.15 says. And they'll say, they'll speak the truth and love to us. And though they do it with love and from an attitude of love, it still comes across to us sometimes as being harsh or criticism. And so how, how do we apply this to our lives, our everyday lives? When someone compliments us for something that we have done, what do we do? Be gracious. <laughs> Be gracious. Likewise, when someone criticizes us for something that we did or something that we said, what do we do then? Be gracious. Be gracious. It's easier said than done. But this is what we're called to do as servants of Christ. Servants of Christ are to be gracious in how they judge themselves. Continuing in verse 3 and in verse 4, it says, In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Again, I want to be clear, Paul wasn't claiming that he was perfect and sinless, and he, he didn't have any flaws. And if you're, not, you're still not convinced, read Romans 7. Right? Read Romans 7 and, and you'll see his attitude and his, his loathing of the sin that he still struggled with. Right? The, the wretchedness that he felt whenever he uh, gave in to temptation to sin. Right? He, that he would often desire to do the things he ought to, but he wouldn't. He would sin instead. And so that's not what he's saying here. Paul was quite aware of the fact that his own opinion of himself had the same ability to crush, up, crush him or puff him up just like the opinion of others. Because we can do it too, can't we? That's right. that, that we can begin to think too highly of ourselves at times. Or, or we can go the other direction and we can just beat ourselves up. Right? We just continue, I'm not good enough. I, I don't talk good enough. I'm not a good teacher. I'm not a good preacher. I'm not a good pastor. I'm not a good deacon. I'm not a good mom. I'm not a good dad. I'm not, again, right? Comparing ourselves to others. Right? We, we can do that. We can beat ourselves up. His fan club in Corinth had the potential to make him become prideful. Right? And that can happen. I mean, to, to, to some people, they hear they have a whole group of people. They have hundreds of people that are saying, I'm of a Paul or I'm of Apollos. Wouldn't that make you prideful? Mm. Man, I must really be something. I got all these people that just, just follow me around. And I can do no wrong. And they just love me to death. Get the big head. Mm. Paul had to battle that. His haters in Corinth had the potential to make him think seriously about quitting the ministry and going back to tent making full time. Alright? This is hard. I'm tired. Why am I doing this? And can I ask you fast? I've had those thoughts too. Right? Any, any pastor has probably had those thoughts as well. Why am I doing this, dude? Do, do, I don't need this. I, I don't need this type of criticism. I don't need this type of fill in the blank. Right? This is, you know, and Brother Paul told me early on when I came into his office and we was talking and I, and I was telling about something that was going on. We was working with the youth and some of the stuff I was dealing with. He said, look, he said, Mike, he said, I was going to cut it to you straight. If you can't deal with this, you might as well go back to Pullamire. Hmm. I said, because it only gets worse from here. He said, you're just a volunteer working in the youth. How do you think it is being a pastor of a church? That's right. How much stuff you got to deal with there, Right. And so I think that's Paul was kind of just bringing these things out, right? He, he's saying, 
that, 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 that even my own thoughts about myself can cause me the same thing. I can begin to think too highly of myself or too lowly of myself. I, I, I let those words of others begin to impact me and I think about myself wrongly. Again, who, 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 the only voice that matters, the only opinion that matters about me is the Lord's, ultimately. Yes, I care about your opinions. Yes, I definitely care about my wife's opinion of me. But ultimately, it's what God says about me that matters. Amen. It should be the same for you. It should be the same for you. We all have our critics, but, but nobody is harder on us than we are to ourselves at times. But like Paul, even on our worst days, our goodness isn't what justifies us before God. That's right. <laughs> on our best days, when we actually wake up in the morning and, and we, we don't do anything else, we open our Bibles and we do our Bible readings and we spend time in prayer, and then maybe we get up there and then we make some phone calls and check on some church members. And maybe we leave from there and we go put in a couple hours at a, at a, at a, a, a homeless shelter. And, and then we wait at an intersection and help little old ladies across the street. Right? We do all these wonderful things. And even those, on those days, those rare days, where that doesn't justify us before God. That's right. Only Christ's work on our behalf justifies us before God. Amen. You see... Paul is trying to liberate the believers there in Corinth. He's trying to liberate us from that weight. It's not up to us. It's not about what we do for God. It's what Christ did for us. That's right. We are justified by our goodness. We're justified by Christ's goodness and His imputed righteousness to us. We are justified by grace alone through faith alone. That's what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. None of us are going to enter the kingdom of God. None of us are going to stand before Jesus on Judgment Day and kind of say, you're, you're blessed to have me on your side. right? You, you should be so thankful that I was a member of Occupy 2. That church would have fell apart without me. You know all the things I did? How many years I served there? How faithful I was. None of us are going to do that. That's right. None of us are going to boast. None of us are going to brag. We're going to be so, so grateful to God for what He did for us. The gift that we received in Christ. We aren't justified by what others think of us or even what we think of ourselves. All that should matter to us is what the Lord thinks of us. Amen. Right? All that should matter to me is what the Lord thinks of me. All that should matter to you is what the Lord thinks of you. That's right. Why? Because only the Lord can judge us with a perfect and right judgment. Right. Only the Lord, only God can see us rightly. Anthony, Anthony Thistleton summed up what Paul was saying in these verses like this. He said, Paul does not therefore advocate a thick skin indifference to public opinion. His point is, in a different, is a different one. Namely, it's fallibility relatively in, lim in limits that make it an, un an unreasonable, an unreliable guide on which to depend. Everything we must be left with God in the final analysis. And one should not give privilege to one's own introspective assessments. Why? Because we're flawed. That's right. Right? We're, we're flawed. We don't, we don't know everything rightly. We don't see everything the right way. Everything can, can be uh, misunderstood about others and mis misunderstood about ourselves. And so we need to be careful about this. <clears throat> Servants of Christ are to be gracious in how they judge others also. And verse 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and, and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Again, Paul wasn't saying that we are never to make any judgments about anyone else. That's not, that's not what's being said here. I mean, in, in the next chapter, when we get to chapter 5, he's going to make a serious judgment against a man that was having sexual relationship with, with his stepmom. Right? And so, so don't take this as a blanket statement that we're never to make judgments. I mean, goodness, you make dozens, if not hundreds, of judgments every day. You know, you make a judgment about a date night. 
You know, who's going to watch? Who's going to watch the the kids? You make a judgment. You make a right judgment. You make a wrong judgment. You put your kid in peril, right? So it's not. That's not what he's saying here. We know every time we hear somebody say, "Judge not, lest you be judged," or you know, you're, "Don't judge me." The Bible is clear on that. We're not to be judgmental, right? But we're always making judgments, and so I think that's kind of what Paul was talking about here in, in a similar way. When the evidence is clear and undeniable regarding a sinning brother or sister, a judgment is appropriate. Right? It's appropriate. And in fact, I would even say it's necessary. If you love me, right, confront me. And love in the right time, in the right place, and you should be open to that as well. It's appropriate. It's necessary. What Paul was saying is that we must be careful when we make judgments of others. We're never to be judgmental of others regardless of their transgression. Because we'll do that too. We'll We'll, we'll say their, their sin is just horrible and theirs is worse than mine. I might sin, but I don't sin like that. Right? That's being judgmental. That's what we're to avoid. We're, we're not to do those things. That we're, we're required to make judgments all the time, but we're nobody's, nobody's judge. God is, ever, is the judge. He's the only judge, and His judgments are always right. We don't have the wisdom. We don't have the insight. We don't have the authority to be someone else's judge. But Jesus does. That's right. The Lord does. That's what Paul's saying here. The Lord does. He has all those things that we don't have. He has perfect wisdom, perfect insight, perfect authority to be our judge. His judgment is the only judgment that truly matters. When Jesus comes back, He will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Right? The hidden things. Secret things. When He comes back, He will reveal the counsels of the heart. So what does that mean? What does it mean for us? It means that all of our secret sins won't be a secret anymore. That's right. Yeah. Let me just let you know a little secret. It's not a secret to Him now. That's right. Our secret sins might be secrets to us. There might be things that I do that you don't know about and likewise. But guess what? There, we have no secrets before God. And that might give you, just cause you to be a little nervous right now, but let me tell you something else. None of our sins shock God. None of our sins remove God's grace for us or in our lives. And in fact, it's because of our sin that we all continue to need grace every day. Right? Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And so take peace in that and understanding that. It also means that whatever is truly in our hearts, Whatever motivates us to do what we do and say what we do, that will also be revealed. Again, I talked earlier about false pretense. Sometimes we do things for show. Right? We, we, we want people to perceive us a certain way, and so that's why we say what we say and do what we do. Again, that's that, that's that, that's that ugly sin of hypocrisy that we're just putting on a show. We're pretending to be someone that we're not. We want people to think that we're someone that we're not. We want to talk a certain way so they'll think that we're someone that we're not. Guess what? When the, the, the day of judgment comes, all that's going to be revealed about us. We're so concerned about receiving praise from our fellow man and ultimately we want to receive praise from him. Right? And that's what he's talking about here. If our motives were impure, that will be revealed and dealt with appropriately. However, if our motives were pure, then our praise will come from God. Right? Our praise will come from Him. That's what we want. That's what we really want. That's what I want. I'm sure it's what you want. As servants of Christ, we're to be gracious in how we receive judgment and how we judge others and how we judge others. And the third characteristic that we see in our text is that a servant of Christ uh, is to be humble. To be humble. To be humble in regards to how we view and treat other servants of Christ. Others, again, it, Paul keeps going back and forth with these same two ideas. Verse 6 says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively, figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one again." Be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. In verse 6, Paul brings everything kind of back to the source of the tensions there in the church in Corinth, right? The, the divisions that had formed. He had previously used agricultural metaphors and construction metaphors and to describe the way that God had used him and Apollos and 
to establish the church and equip the church in Corinth. But instead of the being just being grateful for their faithful service, they had exalted Paul and exalted Apollos and <coughs> exalted Cephas to a place of that didn't belong to them, right? That they were uh, you know, creating these factions within the church and they were working against one another. Instead of being humble servants that were working together as a united church, they had become puffed up competitors that caused division within the church. That's what was happening. If the members of a local church can't humble themselves and set aside their differences to work together to advance the gospel, it's likely because they don't really understand the gospel. That's right. Right? It's likely because we don't really understand the gospel. Understanding and believing the gospel is what separates saved people and lost people. Because the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, right? Paul said that earlier back in chapter 1. But it's the power of God and the wisdom of God to those who are being saved. Amen? That's, that's what, again, I think he's reminding the, the, the people there, the, the believers in, in Corinth of this truth. It's the power of the gospel that unites and unifies the church. It's the power of the gospel that unites and unites, or unifies and unites saved people, or at least that's what's supposed to happen anyway. That's the plan. That's the way it should work out. But unfortunately, it doesn't always happen like that. It wasn't happening in Corinth for sure. Right? That's why that's the purpose of this letter that Paul was writing. But you know, so the question is why was that happening then and why does it still happen now? It happened in Corinth because they went beyond what was written in Scripture. <laughs> right? They they went beyond what was written in Scripture, right? The, the Scripture tells us how we're to relate to uh, human leadership and, and, and reverence and respect. That's all fine and good, but no one is to be exalted. No, no one is to, to take up a, a place of, of being worshipped. Only, only God is to be worshipped, not any fellow uh, man. You see, that still happens today, right? Do, do we still go beyond the Scriptures at times? In our, per, in our personal lives? Or in the church, do we go beyond and, and we'll say, well, you know, I know it's not in Scripture, but that's how we do it here. You know, I know the Bible doesn't say that, but this is the way we've always done it. I mean, that's a red flag. Right. It, it, we're going beyond the Scriptures. And, and a lot of the source of our problems, the, 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 the source of our frustration with each other is because we'll do that. We'll, well, I know the Bible doesn't say that, but this is, you know, this is the way we've, we've been doing this for like, as long as I've been here, we've always done it this way. That's a problem, right? That's Again, that's adding to. That's going beyond what is written, what we have within God's Word. Everything that we need to know about how to relate to God and to relate to one another as fellow servants of Christ, it's written down in God's Word for us. Don't go beyond it. Don't go beyond it. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. John MacArthur gives some clarity to what Paul meant for them and us to not think beyond what is written in his commentary on this verse. He said this. He said, God's faithful servants are to receive proper honor and respect, but they are to be honored only within such bounds of Scripture. Godly respect turns into ungodly exaltation when we exceed what is written. When loving gratitude and legitimate loyalty are contaminated with pride and conceit, Christ's church is fractured and weakened. What God intends is a means of unity. Satan turns into a means of division. I think we've all seen that. We've all seen that, and, and to some of our shame, we've probably been a part of that. We've kind of added to that, amen? amen. Right? We've seen that. We know this has happened. This still happens. Servants of Christ are also to be humble in how they view themselves. Verse 7, For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Like Jesus, Paul was masterful in using questions, right? Questions that really made you think, right? Kind of turn things around and make you examine yourselves, right? To reveal what was really going on in the, the, the people's hearts as they read God's Word, as they read the, His letters, to, to gain a better perspective of themselves. And Paul used these three questions to help them to see their pridefulness and their arrogance. I believe another way of opposing that first question is this. What makes you so special? <laughs> right? What, what makes you so special? Why are you so uppity? 
You know, why are you so puffed up? Why do you exalt yourself? Who do you think you are? I think that helps make the other two questions make a little more sense. What Paul was reminding them of is they were sinners that had been saved by grace. Right? That's, that's, that's all they were. That's all that we are. Right? Sinners that have been saved by grace. Apart from Christ, they were condemned and headed to hell. That's true for all of us. That's right. That's true for every believer, right? But what, what makes us think that we're so great and we're so special? Everything that they had received came from God. Their life came from God. Grace came from God. Forgiveness came from God. The skills, talents, and, and all the wisdom and all knowledge, all of it, all understanding, all of it came from God. Every bit. They had no reason to be prideful. No reason to exalt themselves. None. None whatsoever. They had nothing in which to boast about. They were like turtles on fence posts. Mm -hmm. Right? My, second, my favorite illustration. If you ever see a turtle on a fence post, someone else put it there. That's right. Because turtles can't climb the fence posts, apparently. I've never seen one anyway. That, but that's who we are. It's a perfect example. We are who we are by God's grace. We have what we have by God's grace. The skills, the talents, the abilities that we have all come from God. Amen. We've received everything from Him. There's no room for pridefulness or arrogance within the life of a servant of Christ. There's no room for pridefulness or arrogance within the local church either. Right? There's no room for pridefulness or arrogance. If we think that we're better than everyone else, we'll also probably think that we're too good to serve anyone else too. Mm. Right? They should be serving me. Mm. Right? You know who I am? Right? You, you should be waiting on me. I want to be waiting on you. Right? That's the wrong attitude to have. Right. Are we glad that Jesus didn't take that kind of attitude? Mm. Are, we, are we glad that He didn't think that way? Are we glad that Jesus humbled Himself for our sake? Philippians 2, 3-8 to Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery uh, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Wow. The next time that we find ourselves having a hard time being humble, or we struggle, struggle with being humble, right? struggle with humility, we need to remind ourselves of the way that Jesus humbled himself for us. That should humble us. <laughs> if we need humbling, think of how what, what Christ went through and how He humbled Himself for us. As servants of Christ, we're to be humble in how we view and treat other servants of Christ and how we view ourselves. So this morning as we wrap up our time together, as we close, everything that has been, every one of us, everyone that has been saved by believing Christ is a servant of Christ. That's right. If I were to ask for a show of hands this morning, if you're saved, I said, how many servants of Christ in this room? Every, every person there should have a hand up. That's right. We're all servants of Christ. Every one of us. Every believer is an under rower, not just pastors and deacons. Every servant of Christ is to be faithful, gracious, and humble because Christ is faithful, gracious, and humble. And we're to be Christ-like, right? That's the goal. Right? We become more and more like Christ with each passing day. And so if we're to be faithful, gracious, and humble, I just ask you, are, could those three words be used to describe you? Could they? Right? Are you being faithful in your service to God? Are, are, are you being faithful in your stewardship of God's Word? Are you being gracious in how you receive judgment from others? Are you being gracious in how you judge yourself? In other people? Are you being humble in regards to how you view others and yourself, right? These are important questions that we need to answer and answer them honestly. Because if we're going to be servants of Christ, we need to conduct ourselves the way the Bible says a servant of Christ conducts, con conducts himself, right? We don't, want to, we don't want to go beyond what is written. 
We want to see what is written and follow what is written, right? Be faithful. Because faithful, faithfulness is what? Required. That's right. It's required. It's not optional. But these things can't be said of you. That needs to be addressed. And addressed this morning. Maybe you need to do it in a form of prayer. You need to confess it to God again. He already knows. He already right. sees. He's waiting for us to agree with Him. Confess it to Him as a sin that it is and, and, and repent. If you're struggling with any of these like I do, maybe you need to do like I do and make them part of your daily prayers. Right? After you, after you get pray, get done praying for the 500 things that are going on and this one has this one's sick, this one has cancer, this one has a job interview, this one's having... Right? Then you get around to, to, to maybe things for yourself. God, help me be faithful today. Help me be a, a faithful and obedient to you. Help me to be faithful, a faithful steward of your word today. Help me. God, help me be gracious. Help me be gracious. I, I, I find myself getting angry and I don't take criticism well. Help me be gracious, God. Father, help, help me. I, I tend to get puffed up when somebody gives me a compliment. Right? Help me be gracious. Or, or, or that last one, help me be humble. Oh, that's a dangerous one. You know, because because it's usually something bad has to happen to make you humble. To be humble. Right? Sometimes when we get older, we think we can do what we, we did when we were younger. And, and we'll just pick up on something heavy. I can do that. Yeah, you do it all right, and you don't walk for a week. Why? You've been humbled. <laughs> so spiritually, it's the same way, right? We ask God to help us to be humble. And that, that usually requires something that's going to humble us. Something difficult. But that's what it takes. It's, it's worth it. We need to be faithful. We need to be gracious. We need to be humble. The reason that, that some of us are so miserable is because we're not being who and what God created us to be. Right? That's right. We're not we're not not living our lives as a servants of Christ that we've been called to be. Why why do you feel like you're you just feel like you're not making a difference? Maybe it's because you're not. Oh. <laughs> it's legitimate, but it's also maybe just because you're not doing what God wants you to do, not being who He wants you to be. He created you to be a child of God and a servant of Christ. All right? That's what we know from God's word. So if that's if you're here this morning and you say, well, I don't, I'm not, I'm not even a Christian yet. Well, then you're not going to be a servant of Christ. You have no reason to be, mm -hmm. but you can be today. That's right. that, that can all change today. You can stop serving yourself. You can stop serving the world. Stop serving Satan, and you can start serving Christ today. That can change today if you're ready and willing to change. Just simply repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ and He will save you and He will commission you and you'll begin your path on becoming a servant of Christ. Today you can become a child of God and a servant of Christ because that's what you've been created, created to be. Amen? Let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. God in heaven, we, we're so thankful again for this day. We're so thankful for your, your word. In Scripture, your word is in places called a mirror. When we look into your word, we look into the, the mirror that is your word. God, we sometimes we see some things about ourselves that, that we don't like, that, that, that we're not very happy about, that we're not pleased with. But that's not the end. That's not just the purpose of looking into that mirror. The, the, the point is that we would take steps to make changes. That, that with your help and your leadership, God, that you would help us to become the servants of Christ that you have created us to be, that you've called us to be. And so, God, I pray for myself this morning. I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ this morning that we would be faithful, that we'd be found faithful, in our service to you and, and, and as uh, stewardship of your word, God, I, I pray that, that we would be a gracious people, that we'd be a, a humble people, God. Father, help us to live our ways and 
in a way that reflects the, the, the same way that Christ lived His life. Father, I also pray for those here this morning maybe that don't yet know Christ as Lord and Savior. Never turn from their sins, never place their faith in Jesus. God, I pray that You would prick their hearts this morning. That You would help them to do that. Help them to turn from their sins and turn to Jesus. That today would be the day of salvation for them. Today would be the day that they would become a child of God. Today would be the day that they would become servants of Christ. God, do a work in all of our hearts this morning. Help us to all leave here um, in the way that you would have us to leave here. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.